data that's been collected by the CRD, uh, there's continual monitoring of our practice, of our discharges into the ocean, and a lot of data has been collected, a lot of reports, a lot of evidence. It's all been reviewed by many qualified professionals, including public health officers, wastewater engineers, CRD staff, and scientists from the Institute of Ocean Sciences, the University of Victoria, private consulting firms, and Washington State. Some of them are here this evening. Here's one such review. And Dr. Chris Garrett is one of the authors. Authors is here this evening. The authors of this review and many other marine scientists have gone on record stating that they do not see any <coughs> urgent need for land-based treatment and the CRD's current sewage disposal <coughs> practice is a relatively minor issue on here on the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And remember, some of the authors in these reports are from Washington State. We hear a lot of concern from Washington State. They don't like what we're doing. Um, but the scientists who review it, the scientists from Washington State don't see a problem. It's a minor issue. <coughs> also, I realize I should mention uh, about the flows that I mentioned, the Eastern flow, because it uh, comes in on the southern shore, it comes back out uh, along the, uh, the shore of southern Vancouver Island. Our discharges do not get into Puget Sound or over into Port Angeles. Our practice is not affecting them. There will be no referendum as long as you're in the CRD board. Uh, well, I don't make the rules, but my... Well, you won't my, call for one. My, my sense is that the board is not interested in... Um, a, well, a referendum would have no impact on on the CRD in, decision. Well, in no on the on the decision by the provincial and federal governments, they don't care about a referendum. They give the the order, or they they say you must meet these regulations, and the referendum has no impact on their, that decision by them. Well, you remember the HST referendum, the government didn't want it to uh, to happen the way it did but they did care uh, well well there was a, there was a legal process for allowing that there is not for this in this case it's not a major expense and when a major expense uh, there's not a requirement for a referendum uh, no for the simple reason I've said that if you ask upstream cities whether their sewage treatment system is good and they say it's great we just dump it in the river and it goes away well, this is not a river. That's not the, yeah. Those aren't the people you have to ask. You have to ask the people downstream. And the people in Washington Straits, State, they sort of think of themselves as being downstream. And, and how do you know that they think that way? Do you have any oh, evidence oh, of that? Hear, oh, yes. We, we hear, um, I think, um, after we'd made the decision to proceed, we got a letter from, I think, the governor of Washington saying, I'm certainly glad you're planning to do this. We haven't heard a lot from them lately because it's well known that we are embarking on this. But I think if we were to change our minds and say, we think ocean disposal is great, I think we would hear a lot from our neighbors. Mm, from the governor of Washington. I think from, from uh, communities in Washington, probably the lower mainland and perhaps up island as well. Sea life actually is thriving around the Alp Falls. Another um, accusation about our system is that it's causing dead zones around the Alp Falls. In fact, sea life is thriving around the outfalls. Here's some photographs taken from a submarine that's, oh my goodness, very dark, but it can barely make out there's some sea stars. This is also a photograph that I believe shows some scallops and mussels and uh, an uh, anemone. Also, a sea slug. That's actually a sea slug, that dark spot. And uh, crabs, these are they're right up on the pipe right on the outfall pipe. And uh, this last one, I hope we can see it. Yes, some fish. These are copper rockfish, some uh, sea, sea pens. Now what's out of view in any of these photographs is the, in the sediments are worms that are functioning like organisms in the digester ponds of a land-based secondary sewage treatment system. Those worms are in the sediment and the natural system around the outfalls would not function without them. In the same way that Victoria's 
garden composters would not function without earthworms. Charles Darwin spent years of his life documenting that worms are essential to the health of an ecosystem. The next picture is packed with CRD data about marine life around the <coughs> discharges. Now, it's a bar graph, and I hope that uh, I hesitated about whether or not I should include this. It might look a little bit daunting. But this is loaded with so much very important information about what's happening around the outfalls that it, I'm, I hope I can walk you through this and help you understand just how uh, good and how effective our outfalls are and how, the, uh, how positive one of the effects is. What this graph is showing is the amount of biomass and the distance from the pipe. So these, this is the greatest distance from the pipe and this is at the pipe. And you notice the trend is increasing toward the pipe. The closer you get to the pipe, the more sea life there is. Thank you. First surprise. Now, these colors, this is very important. Each color represents a particular animal group. At that location, that's the amount of, a measurement of the amount of that animal group. Each color is a different animal group. And what's very important, what this graph is showing us is that there are, there's a diversity of life at every measurement. What it also shows, another very important feature, is no one animal group dominates. And these two facts together, the fact that there's a diversity of animal groups and that no one animal group dominates, is indicative of a healthy ecosystem. Very contrary to the story that the practice is causing dead zones. And actually, for starters, I would like to pay great credit to the wonderful engineers at the CRD who designed, built, and operate the present excellent system. And I'd like to pay great credit to, and, um, and great credit to, to the scientists down at the CRD who have this outstanding monitoring program. So if you talk to them, and you kind of, for pharmaceuticals and personal care products, you kind of have to go through a long list one by one. You cannot just say things are harmless or toxic. But if you say, well, what should we be worried about? Something that tends to come to the top of the list, as I understand it, is something called 17-alpha-ethanyl-estradiol. And don't ask me to spell it, um, but it's short, it's known as EE2. And this is something that is a, an estrogen, and it comes largely from um, metabolized, metabolites of birth control pills. And this is something which remarkably, even in a concentration of parts per trillion, which is like a drop in many swimming pools, um, could cause harm to larval freshwater fish. The marine studies, I don't think, have been done. So, and, and in fact, the concentration in the raw effluent is such that one would be concerned. But if you then say, A, will land-based treatment take care of it, only partly, and you might then just concentrate it on the sludge, where it might eventually degrade, and does it cause a problem in the marine environment? Almost certainly not, because once you dilute it in the, in the water by um, hundreds or thousands of times, it's no longer a problem according to any studies that have been done. Moreover, some of it might be trapped to sediments and it would sink to the seafloor in the 100 meters or so near Macaulay Outfall particularly, and then it would, would just slowly degrade in the still oxygen-rich environment that is present. So if you go through things one by one, you tend to say there are things we should analyze, but nothing we are presently concerned about, nor likely to be concerned about in the future. And I think Michael would like to say something about the metals. I think the answer for the metals is very much like Chris had mentioned for the E2, for the, uh, for the uh, estrogens. The, the problem with the metals is not a big, a big problem at all. It's more of a red herring. First of all, Victoria is not very industrialized, so the discharge of metals is, is minor. They also don't tend to bioaccumulate because of the way that they're sedimented out, except in the areas where there's high current and therefore they're winnowed away and carried out into the ocean. Um, I think the most important thing though in this question is that we're instituting very good source control in Victoria and we tend to ignore that. And this is something where we really should be putting our money. Rather than trying to clean it up, which is not needing cleaning, let's make sure there's no more input. The things to worry about are things that are really persistent. Um, right now, these things become so dilute uh, that they're not, not a problem while they slowly degrade. 
the things that are a problem, the things that persist for hundreds of years, maybe like PCBs, which have been banned for decades, and the fire retardants, the PBDs, which have, have recently been banned, will continue to accumulate for a while and build up in marine mammals. But um, that banning some of those persistent things is the only way to go. The other things seem not to be a problem because they become really dilute and then degrade. Thank you. The other thing that I should say regarding uh, passing the regulations, we would fail without doubt on one item, and that is it is required that we use rainbow trout. And I have not seen too many rainbow trout surviving in the ocean. By the regulations, we would have to use rainbow trout to make to assay the water passing out of the uh, initial dilution zone. So with that caveat, we could easily, and I mean by orders of magnitude, meet all of the federal and provincial requirements. I must say something about this. Uh, the content, this was brought about by reference to the fed, federal regulations, and this is used as such a red herring. I, as you could imagine, have read this over very carefully. I have looked through it visually. I have used my computer to look for words, and I can tell you without a doubt that within the federal regulations that we are all being said we have to go by, it does not mention the word treatment, it does not mention the word secondary anywhere in the document. There are five red things, five restrictions that we have to do. Four of these, I won't go into them, but four of these we can meet within 10 meters, I am sure, of the pipeline. All we have to do is get the government to agree to an initial dilution zone. Whether it's 10 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters, 100, is something the scientists can determine. But we have to have the initial dilution zone before we can even make any headway on this thing. The other one, which I've already talked to, talked about, is we have to change rainbow trout for marine species. <laughs> okay. But uh, <clears throat> the thing is, we are not requiring the federal government to make wholesale changes in the regulations. We only have to have two things changed. Change the fish, except the initial dilution zone. If they do those two things, we're free and clear. I would suggest that we at least demand that the people at UVic who have uh, taken the unusual step of writing a public letter, the 10 scientists, marine biologists, oceanographers, and others, who've t uh, and also a former dean of science, who've taken the steps of writing a public letter, at least uh, have their views properly examined, and at least are asked to peer review the CTAC report. They say there is so many other priorities. Uh, why do we have to spend almost a billion dollars, $780 million? Uh, by the time it's finished, it'll probably be twice as uh, large like uh, many projects. And why do we have to make this a priority and spend that money when uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, poor people in the streets, uh, mentally disordered people that need some attention and housing and uh, uh, transportation, maybe uh, more buses, better service. Um, free buses, something like that. Uh, why do we have to put that billion dollars into the sewage since it's not uh, a priority, or is it a priority? Um, I think that you're probably right that if we were deciding priorities within the region, uh, we probably would think that, for example, rapid transit might, might be a, um, a, an alternative that we'd prefer. Uh, that said, uh, there, the, the higher upper levels of government have established very clear regulations uh, that require us to take this action. When we ask for sympathy from the rest of Canada, though, uh, I think, and or the other cities in the United States, I think we have to expect that their reaction will be, everyone else does it, um, and and so that the sympathy we're going to get for the cost 
is going to be limited by the fact that every other municipality, no matter how poor, uh, is required to, to, to treat their sewage in, a, in what is a responsible way for them. No, they're saying we are treating it. It's not like we're not um, treating it. So it's, well, it's just a, an upgrade to that treatment that they object as not necessary. W well, yeah, that that is the scientific argument. I, the 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 economic argument is is a separate one. the 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 issue uh, for the board has been uh, one of the issues is that the two upper levels of government recognizing that that we have not uh, we have been able for many years to have pretty good treatment without. A treatment system um, have offered to make a very significant contribution to the cost, uh, a third of the cost each. I think even today, if we were to go and ask for that money, we would find it uh, tougher to get it. Um, I think, um, I think, given the environmental challenges that that face the country and the the other uh, issues that that all those upper levels of government face, I think that. Um, uh, there's a feeling on by board members that um, if we don't take advantage of this uh, offer and if we try to uh, delay the process and and go take legal action to to resist um, installing the uh, treatment that when we do go which might be in a very short time from now uh, we would find a much less sympathetic ear by the senior levels of government and we would end up Still with the requirement, but without these subsidies. Uh -huh. Now, in the list of arguments that we faced, there was a constant theme. The science can be ignored. Well, that is true in politics up to a point. There can be times when emotionalism trumps the science, and today there are plenty of examples of policies based on unsustainable development models where science has been put in the back seat or not taken into account at all. But I spent seven years as Minister of two science departments, Fisheries and Oceans and Environment, and if a government is going to ignore science, it makes a great deal of good sense to at least be aware what knowledge and insights you have decided to ignore or minimize. Ignorance can be very costly. A uh, 2009 study out of California titled Delusion and Deception in Large Infrastructure Projects. <laughs> you got it. Warns that the cost overrun, that the cost overruns of 50% are common in large infrastructure projects. That certainly is our experience in British Columbia. Let's take a look at this table. Fast ferries, 120% overrun. <laughs> Vancouver Con Convention Center. 78% uh, overrun. BC Place revitalization, 55%. Portman Highway, 121%. Cost overrun. What's your faith in the idea that there won't be a cost overrun in this project? Got some numbers down here, which I should explain. This number is the, the uh, estimated cost for all of the uh, uh, infrastructure that will be built uh, by uh, 2030. Um, who knows what the cost overruns will be. Uh, but about the cost overruns, I want to speak a bit more on that. Um, given that the very existence of this project is due to irrational thinking of local politicians and a flawed irrational law of a single standard imposed on the entire country, I have personally have little faith that there will be rational control of our tax dollars to prevent cost overruns. The th also, I should mention the one-third sharing formula, all three levels of government sharing the one-third, as Dr. Peck uh, mentioned to us, does not apply to the cost overruns. CRD taxpayers will be responsible for 100% of cost overruns. The responsibility people in public office have to spend money wisely. Of course there will be times when things don't work out, when expenditures are higher than expected and results are less. And that happens in other fields of personal and private life as well. Um, but, no, uh, it's, it, it, but that is no reason for abandoning the worthwhile goal of trying to make sure that you spend money wisely. In the final analysis, the role of the elected official is to steer public expenditures in the direction of where society thinks those, sun, those funds can provide the greatest benefit. 
Remember, all funds can be used somewhere else. If you take money and put it into something that has little benefit, and from, from the environmental point of view, such as is being proposed by the CRD, you are taking it away from other worthwhile causes, perhaps causes with, in the medical field or hospital field, perhaps in the schools, perhaps other environmental causes, such as, for example, dealing with the much more, much more pressing issue, in my view, of uh, road runoff, uh, stormwater runoff. If you take money and use it this way, you can't use it in another way. And that's what politicians' major function is, to determine the direction of public expenditures. The issue should not be resolved by the citizens of the region, like in this case uh, the CRD, the people in, living in CRD. Should we have another referendum like they did 20 years ago? Well, the problem with referendums is they ask the people who are going to pay not the people who are affected. There are a lot of people who say carbon dioxide emissions aren't something that we want to bother stopping. In fact, you might argue that most governments are still saying that because, of course, you don't feel the impact of your own carbon dioxide emissions. You feel the impact of everyone else's. Um, Chicago thought they had a great sewer system. They dumped their sewage into the Mississippi River. The people who objected were not the people of Chicago. They were the people of St. Louis downstream who got the sewage. Referendums aren't a good way of, of asking and finding, determining whether you should be uh, taking environmental steps. You don't think that people in general would understand what you just said that uh, is impacting the neighbors, perhaps, uh, you're referring to the people in Washington uh, on the other side of the channel here? Well, gov governments, governments won't ask us to do a referendum and don't, and th they, they make the requirement. They say you have to have sewage treatment. They don't say you have to have sewage treatment if your citizens agree to pay for it. They say you have to have sewage treatment if you don't install it, then we'll force you to do it and we'll collect the taxes to do it. It's as simple as that. Has there been any exceptions when, exemptions when the government has demanded something from a city and the people said, no, we're not going to do that? Is there any... Um, I think the exemptions would, would be not on the basis of not the citizens not wanting to do it. It would be on a, on a scientific basis. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, certainly we're very well aware of the scientific arguments. And I think if we were requesting an exemption or felt there was a good possibility of getting an exemption it would be on the on the scientific basis but you won't require you won't request well, an exemption well i think the feeling of and and i don't want to speak to other board members cuz there there's a whole range Just of different from, views from your side, yeah. but i i think the for me um, we have um, we've been given the requirement we've talked informally at the at the staff level with with people we talk uh, the political level, and I think the feeling we're getting is um, the time has come for Victoria to do it. Um, they don't feel that uh, they want to go and tell the world Canada does sewage treatment, except for Victoria, because Victoria has has a good place to dump their sewage into the ocean. That's not an argument they want to make, and I don't think that that the chance of getting an exemption that lasts for a significant period of time is great enough that we want to abandon our current um, uh, process and say we want to uh, go to court, try and get an exemption or try to get a political exemption and knowing that when we go back, if we're unsuccessful, we're starting fresh with our requests for assistance. To get involved in expenditures which take us into that period, expenditures which have no benefit, is the height of irresponsibility. Thank you very much. Uh, for six years, I've been questioning the proposed project, criticizing it, and voting against it. And I must say also, uh, Mayor Desjardins in Esquimalt and Mayor Hill uh, from View Royal have been doing much the same thing. But that's only three out of a committee of 14. I can answer the question about what will happen to families. Well, what will happen to families is that you will see an increase in your taxes 
of somewhere between $200 and $1,000 by 2016 just for that project alone. You know, we get concerns when we raise taxes by $75. This could be, in some cases, a, a tax increase of easily of $500. And that's just for this project. That doesn't, that's just capital. That doesn't take into you know, account the fact that we're about $15 million a year loss uh, for operating that also is going to have to be absorbed. What that means to a politician, as some people have mentioned, is the things that we won't be able to do. If we hit taxpayers with that kind of increase, we're not going to be able to hit them again. I mean, I wouldn't want to, and we wouldn't be able to. That means things like LRT, which arguably could provide much greater benefit, will probably be put off for decades. Replacement of existing infrastructure that's old and decaying, homelessness, affordable housing, there simply won't be the money to address those things. And that is huge. You know, one of the things hasn't been mentioned in the federal regulation. That I think Dr. Peck mentioned that if we are considered high risk, we must comply with regulations by 2020. If we are judged to be medium risk, we have till 2030 to comply. If we were judged to be of low risk, then we have till 2040 to comply. So one of the things I would really like to see people do, and I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get the CRD to do it, but somebody to challenge the federal government on how we could possibly be classified as high risk. We aren't. We're low risk. If we're classified low risk, we are looking at a period of 30 years to comply, an awful lot can happen in 30 years. And one of the things that will probably happen is we will move to treatment. And the reason why is something called microbial fuel cells. They are a fuel cell that uses sewage as a fuel and uses microbes to transfer the sewage directly into electricity. They've been developing for a number of years now. This summer, a research group in Oregon discovered a way to get from 10 to 50 times the amount of electricity of the fuel cell. They hope to go to pilot this year or early next year. It could be commercially, commercially applicable within five years. That would mean that sewage, in fact, could become a very high net generator of electricity and energy. Then it makes sense. The unfortunate thing is, this thing that we are putting in, which I think is a complete out white elephant, quite likely will also be completely obsolete immediately or fairly shortly after it is complete. So I wish you well, and I hope you, uh, you tell everybody about your concerns and you speak to as many people as possible. Thank you. We can continue begging our political representatives and governments to please see it our way. Or we can start building our own system of direct democracy by writing our own rules and laws and deciding by referendum what is convenient to us. A framework of this perpetual direct democracy is published on this little booklet, Perpetual Direct Democracy and published by Amazon.com. You can also read it online for free at pacific.ca. The choice is ours. Continue under the hierarchical system of leaders and followers, or we can create this new system of direct democracy where we are all equals. I am Pedro Mora. <laughs>